Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joan Reed, Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. And thank you for joining us. There are over 200 registrants for today's discussion on leadership lessons learned in medicine and military, including physicians, faculty, students, trainees, social workers, administrators from across multiple schools and community organizations. Today's webinar is sponsored by the HMS, Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. The mission of DICP is to advance diversity and inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. DICP efforts support the career development of junior faculty, trainees, and students, identify and train leaders in academic medicine and health policy, and provide programs that address crucial pipeline issues. Today's webinar is offered through our DICP Equity and Social Justice Initiative. It is the fourth ESJ webinar in the current academic year. And in the fall of 2016, a planning committee comprised of faculty, staff, and students representing our HMS community discussed the establishment of an equity and social justice series to address health disparities, social determinants of health, leadership and health systems, health policy, and other areas affecting vulnerable populations. Since 2016, an average of 10 to 12 programs have been provided annually and in collaboration with our HMS affiliated institutions. ESJ events focus on four areas, history and context, culture and environment, health disparities, and for leadership and skill development. This year, the ESJ lecture series tackles health issues that often impact disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. Our conversations and speakers will address not just defining the disparity, but we'll also discuss interventions on a community, hospital, and policy level to address inequities. A few housekeeping notes as we begin today's session. The chat is not available. Um, microphones will be muted. You should use the Q&A to post questions to panelists, and the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our DICP website. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alden Landry. Dr. Landry is an emergency medicine physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and is a founder of Motivating Pathways, Inc. He's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School, assistant dean in the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. And with this, I'll now turn over to Dr. Landry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed, for the introduction, and thank you to our panelists for being here, and thank you to the audience for being here to uh, be a part of this conversation. I'm excited to uh, introduce our amazing speakers and to uh, really engage in this topic on what we in academic medicine can learn from our colleagues who have served in the military and what they do when it comes to providing high-quality health care uh, for the patients, uh, those, uh, those who volunteered to protect our country. Um, and what they do to provide high quality health care for them and what we can learn in academia in order to improve the care that we provide to our patients. Um, Dr. Reed mentioned the housekeeping note, so please uh, know that we will save some time for Q&A. Uh, please use the uh, Q&A option so we can review those questions and bring those to the forefront and, and really enrich our discussion. I'm excited to introduce our panelists um, and they will share their stories both about their training and their experience prior to uh, joining our institutions here um, and really are going to help us to lead and think about this in a thoughtful way uh, with a few discussion questions that we have uh, that uh, we're going to prepare and present to them. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Goralnik. Uh, he's the medical director for access and network development at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he, like I, uh, is an emergency medicine physician. He's an associate professor of emergency medicine here at Harvard Medical School. And then I want to introduce Dr. Uh, Shalewa Osei. Uh, uh, she is an assistant professor here at Harvard Medical School at uh, MGH. And she is also a current Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health Policy at Harvard University. And with that, I want to say welcome to the both of you for being here. And I really just want to jump into our first question. And so we'll both open it up both to Eric uh, and then uh, to you, uh, Shalewa. Can you just talk about your experience in the military and how it informed your career in, in medicine? Thanks, Alden, and thanks, uh, Dean Reed and uh, the HMS team for hosting us. Uh, and one of the best parts of this was meeting Shalewa and uh, 
learning about each other and everything we share and our focus on caring for patients and, uh, and veterans. Um, so essentially my background is uh, I'm from uh, Los Angeles. I uh, had uh, an early interest in going to a service academy. Um, I was inspired by a Holocaust survivor who told me the most important person in her life uh, was the army soldier that liberated her uh, from Auschwitz. Uh, and therefore my focus became on service. I went to Naval Academy um, and I had no interest in medicine. Uh, I wanted to be a warfighter, right? And so I was a surface warfare officer and served um, uh, for several years, uh, about a decade uh, in the Navy in a variety of different roles on ships, small boats uh, and training uh, the next generation of Navy sailors. And through all this became interested in medicine um, through some experiences overseas uh, and was informed by corpsmen who were the medics of the Navy. Uh, and learned from them and said, that looks pretty cool. Maybe I could do that. And uh, then uh, showed up in an emergency department in San Diego, shadowed a couple uh, clinicians there and uh, applied to med school, took post-baccalaureate classes at night. I uh, went to med school in Israel. Um, I'm Jewish. Uh, I thought that was a wonderful opportunity. I had peers that had done it before, loved living overseas when I was in the Navy. Came back, um, did residency at Yale in emergency medicine and been at Brigham since 2010. Uh, and very much the focus of my sort of academic and operational interest is uh, civilian military collaboration. Uh, and we started several years back, uh, Harvard Med uh, School of Public Health Civilian Military Collaborative, which is focused on uh, supporting and empowering our students and faculty uh, to build relationships around mentorship, uh, in addition to uh, social gatherings uh, to help us sort of advance each other. Uh, and help us uh, collaborate uh, on caring for um, patients uh, and caring for our veterans. We'll turn it over to Shalewa. Um, thank you. I want to say thank you, Dr. Landry, um, Dean Reed, for uh, the invitation. Um, it's been uh, awesome getting to know the veteran family at MGH and um, at MGB at large. Um, I'd say an interesting intersection um, with our stories is uh, when I was, I wanted to do medicine and I remember thinking, um, but I studied engineering um, undergrad because my parents uh, thought that I had to have a professional degree and they're like, what if you change your mind, then what are you going to do with a pre-med, you know, major? Um, and, but uh, the cost of going to medical school uh, in this country seemed prohibitive and um, my uh, organic chemistry teacher was a former um, World War II medical officer in the Navy. And um, he, you know, at that time, I think it was called the Berry Plan. Um, it was part of the Berry Plan through uh, uh, the Vietnam War. And he, um, he was like, well, you know, you should, join the, you should join the Navy. You should just join the service. And, you know, we need, um, we always need doctors. And, um, it was, uh, it was great listening to his stories of the war. So um, I joined, I uh, did the Health Profession Scholarship Program, all the services have it, um, and with the Navy. Um, and they paid for my four years of medical school, um, after which uh, I did my residency uh, with the Navy, um, now Walter Reed Military Medical Center. Um, and uh, served a utilization tour. I think all of us in the Navy know you have to do it some time on the ship. Mine was, was with an aircraft carrier. Um, and then I went off to do my uh, surgical oncology fellowship um, and came back to a uh, military, um, um, military health center. And this was at uh, Balboa, um, known more as formerly as Naval Medical Center, San Diego. Um, and I, I think that uh, my experiences through uh, serving um, at, uh, at Naval Medical San Diego uh, through the different deployments, um, I've uh, been deployed uh, with the Marines, uh, the Navy supplies the medical, um, you know, medical care to the Marines, um, also with the Army, um, has just been seeing how we're able to um, work with teams. Um, how the um, military health system, uh, especially in the deployment world, um, del delivers care uh, and sometimes delivers care, uh, you know, in as cost effective manner as we can, but also um, learning how to make sure caring for those, you know, um, in harm's way and still ensuring that with uh, the least amount that we have, because we don't always have the resources that we have in the ideal world when we are back stateside, but making sure that the care we deliver um, is second to none. And, um, and lastly, just 
the equal access nature of military health care ensures that we're able to deliver some of the care that we want, um, to eliminate some of the disparities that we see in the civilian world. Thank you for sharing your stories and thank you again for your service. Um, I noticed that when we were putting the questions together for this, there was a lot of acronyms that popped up and I think that's uh, uh, something that both the military and medicine share. So there's going to be some acronyms that are thrown out. My recommendation is that we say the recommendation or say those acronyms out for everyone. For, so if you use a military acronym, the folks who may not have any experience know what those are and then vice versa for the medicine acronyms for those who are in the military who may be, may be listening. Um, so uh, the first question is to going to just stick with you, Shalewa. Um, what should listeners be expecting to take away from this presentation as we really jump into it for the next 45 minutes? So I, I think that, you know, um, all of us in, it doesn't matter what role you serve in healthcare, um, you are an important part of the machine um, that delivers healthcare and uh, and you have a voice and we need to we need to hear that voice and so hopefully what you get out of the next 45 minutes is um, how do you do that how do I identify um, you know what your role is and how to um, and how to get across what are some of the benefits that you see um, and how to move the system specifically uh, especially given the topic that we're talking about how to achieve health equity in our healthcare system and most importantly, how you can be a leader in doing that and not just, you know, a spectator. And Eric? Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, building on uh, Shalewa's comments, uh, you know, my understanding, our focus today is really on uh, the overlap between medicine, uh, the military and, and leadership. And, uh, you know, in the military, there's a real emphasis on empowerment, on uh, developing leaders from day one, uh, whether you are enlisting uh, in the service, you're joining as an officer, whatever route that you come in, the focus is on your development uh, to serve the mission and serve the team. And we, in the Navy, we say ship, shipmate, self. And uh, it's a wonderful ethos that uh, is very similar to medicine. And the opportunity here is we're a little bit less intentional about leadership development in medicine. Most of it is OJT, on-the-job training. And uh, there may be some opportunities to learn and translate what we're doing in the military to empower everyone to step up and care for our patients and care for the people that take care of our patients uh, together. So I hope that we can hit up some of those themes today and I'm excited to talk through it with you. Thanks. Awesome. And I just want to say for the record, there's no bias towards any other lines of service. Uh, it just so happened that both of our wonderful presenter served in the Navy. Uh, I myself is, uh, am an Army brat, uh, and uh, Eric likes to give me a little bit of grief every time he sees me about that. Um, but again, uh, we want to recognize that all the branches are, are we, we, we support all of the branches, and even though our speakers are both uh, Navy, uh, Navy experienced. So, uh, you know, Eric, you, you started with this comment about leadership development, and I think it's important for us to really dive into that because I, that is the crux of this discussion. Uh, and so you, can you tell us how does the military train leaders and what can medicine adopt from, from the military? Yeah, you notice that Dr. Landry did not react at all to the Go Navy Beat Army flag I showed a minute ago, but um, we do have a good sense of humor and it's one team, one fight. Um, so what are the key uh, lessons that we can sort of translate from military leadership development to the Navy or to, uh, to medicine? Um, so I think there's many. Um, you know, the first is again, sort of this uh, ethos and focus on uh, from day one uh, development, intentional development. Uh, so beyond uh, sort of informal on the job training and mentorship, there's also a structure. There's uh, a structure in uh, personal development and learning and understanding yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, et cetera. Uh, in addition to uh, team-based learning and working with teams and collaboration. Um, and uh, much of this work, again, can be translated to medicine uh, what do Alden and I do on a daily basis? Most of it is working, you know, uh, with consultations or working with peers and colleagues, nurses, residents, physician assistants, technicians, administrators, other, you know, other physicians. And most of it is conversation and most of it is relational. So, so much of, of what we do is really based on rela relationships and leading. And as uh, Salewa reflected on, we, you can lead from anywhere. 
Um, and I think that's one of the sort of principles here. So, you know, we've actually discussed this with both the HMS undergraduate and in the PGME office. Are there opportunities to build out uh, specific leadership programming and development uh, to train the next generation of physicians so that individuals have the tools, are empowered, um, and have a framework that they can help build on and speak a common language um, to uh, advance patient care through leadership development. And so like, what do you want to uh, add to the discussion? You know, I, I think I put it very well. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, is very, is unique, I think, to the military, but it doesn't have to be because I would say we have the same thing um, in the healthcare system is that we're very clear about the mission and what we're doing. Um, and we think of ourselves as, you know, one team, one fight. How do we all work together to accomplish that mission? Um, in healthcare, I would say we have the same thing. We all want to deliver, you know, excellent patient care. You know, that is our goal, you know, to heal the people um, that we see and uh, to do that as best as we can uh, to deliver quality care. And so the question becomes, how do we do that as a team? Um, I would say that in the last, uh, you know, in the last two to three years, in addition to delivering um, excellent patient care, uh, we now also see as one of our mission statements um, would be to also eliminate healthcare disparities. Um, we have always talked about healthcare disparities, but I think that we are now clear as um, a profession that health equity is also part of our duty and that this is um, something that we want to attain. And so once we, once, I think that's one of the first major steps let, agreeing on what is the mission? What is it that we are here to do? Um, and once we agree on that, then we can start coming up with a language um, that we're going to use um, and what, how we work towards that. Thank you. And I think it's really important that we just um, recognize the importance of a clear mission uh, in all of our discussions and whether it's from a department level, from, uh, from a hospital level or from a systems level, we need to make sure that everyone is on the same accord. And I think that's one thing the military gets right because it's communicated down uh, to everyone uh, in, the, in the chain of command. And that doesn't necessarily carry over into medicine. And I think that's something that we can work on. Um, and sometimes we get mixed messaging from our leadership and how do we make sure that we address that? Um, and so I really want to focus in on maybe talking about uh, communication and what and, and how we in medicine can communicate better, because it's not just about having that conversation with a consultant or having a conversation with a patient. It's about communication across the board. And so, uh, Eric, I'll start with you. How does the military structure support transparency, execution and accountability in, in the space and really talking about communication as a, an area of emphasis here? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, during the time uh, that I was in, um, there, uh, there's a sort of a long arc of uh, how we managed uh, communication. Um, you know, when I think of certainly uh, communication in crisis and, and ideal communication patterns, you can go back to Richard Besser, who was the head of the CDC during H1N1, and how he structured every press conference, which was, uh, here's where we are, here's what we know, here's the gap, and here's how we're going to bridge the gap. Uh, and was very transparent, open, and honest. And um, it's a great model for sort of crisis communication. Uh, the military, um, you know, we learn, uh, you know, pretty early on about uh, somewhat being secretive, right? In the sense that um, much of it is uh, need to know and other terminology, right? Don't, don't talk. I can't tell Alden unless he needs to know this information. Um, which has a role certainly uh, around confidentiality, et cetera. And that does obviously overlap with patient care, uh, respecting patient privacy, et cetera. But when we're talking about a mission, when we're talking about a project, an initiative, um, uh, we've seen this big trans uh, sort of a transformation, at least in the military, more towards uh, being open and transparent in many ways. Uh, you could see that I saw this arc coming more and more uh, over the decade that I spent in the Navy. Um, that was really being encouraging of uh, broadening the group, uh, eliminating silos, and bringing the team together. And you know, you can think about team of teams with Stan McChrystal talking about the daily sort of virtual huddles they had with many, many people on board that were very clear about the points that you made. What's our mission? 
what are our objectives, how are we going to get there and have open and honest, transparent communication and dialogue. Um, I think that's, that is uh, important for us, critically important for us in medicine um, to foster that idea of open, honest communication in a timely fashion, uh, whether it is direct patient care and having a bedside huddle to talk through, identify roles, responsibilities, care for the patient, do a debrief after a trauma resuscitation, which any one of us can do on a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe it's that broader project or initiative. What are we doing around access and capacity for our patients across the system? How can we work together at Brigham and Mass General and BI and others to make sure that patient with the head bleed can get in and get the care that they need? Um, so I think medicine is, is good at espousing the ideal. Uh, they can learn a bit from the military on the execution, which is coming up with you know, a standard cadence or battle rhythm of and expectations of communication, of pushing and pulling information. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I wanna to turn to you, um, Shalewa, because you mentioned uh, issues regarding um, diversity, equity, inclusion in your comments earlier. And I really wanna hone in on this um, because obviously we in medicine are paying attention to this. We are doing better, I would say, than we have in the past, but we're certainly not there yet. Um, I know the military has had its own struggles in this space as well. Um, so how does the military work towards creating communities where respect, um, and uh, coalesces around skills and abilities outweigh ties to race, ethnicity, politics, regionalism, whatever it may be uh, in the United States? So um, the, I, I'd say that there, there's some historical context here and you know, obviously we modify it for our current times. Um, compared to uh, the society at large, I would say that the military has done a better job um, or has, has been on the forefront of integration um, in many ways. And, you know, and so part of, um, I think part of the strengths of the military has been recognizing the importance of diversity and having multiple voices um, at, you know, at the table. Um, as you mentioned, there have been challenges, you know, do we, do we, have we always had representation at the highest levels? Um, not as much as we'd like, maybe only um, in the recent decade have we started to see that. Um, but that is one, I think that is one of the ways that the military has, um, has accomplished this, which is understanding that there is strength and diversity and listening to multiple voices. And part of that, um, I think, is creating a, a baseline of respect. Um, so I remember um, I was actually talking to uh, another um, military person, Air Force, and we were talking about, uh, he was talking about how the things he learned in um, OIS, Officer Indoctrination School, still, you know, he still uses to this day. Um, and there are, there are things that, you know, um, there are things that you learn um, in how to, how to talk to people, um, you know, how to get ideas across, how to listen, um, you know, certainly chain of command, things that you use um, so that the, the role, I think, of things like OIS is um, making sure that we all speak the same language. And, that, and that's very important. Um, and it's important enough in that um, it works across, it doesn't matter if I'm speaking to someone in the Air Force or someone in the Army, there's some general basic you know, rules of communication that are just there and that we understand and, um, and that we use. Uh, and I think that that is something that um, you could also, uh, you also, you could also do in, uh, you know, in the civilian world, especially uh, in healthcare. Uh, because when I think about it, we do that in other ways. For instance, when you're talking about head injuries, whether it's Glasgow Coma Scale, there's certain universal ways that we have to communicate that we all understand. Um, you know, certain terms that we use, um, certain scales that we're all familiar with. Um, that that is one of the ways I think that you know uh, certainly helps with communication. Um, but also, but then the last thing I would say is uh, respect. I, I think it is always important to to be respectful when you're interacting with people, whoever they, um, you know, whoever they are um, in whatever situations. Um, you know, we, we always go with the thought that respect is given un until, you know, 
until you lose it, until you give people a reason not to treat you um, with respect. Um, and especially in what we see around us right now, I think that there is a lot can be said about reintroducing that into our routine, um, you know, routine communications and interactions with one another. And Eric, I want to bring you into this as well, because I know you you have some thoughts about this. Yeah, I think I think you said it uh, beautifully um, uh, in you know this context of of having a framework, uh, as you've outlined, uh, with some shared expectations, respect being one of them, communication framework. Y you know, it's interesting. I, I think of um, uh, pretty early on uh, in the military, I experienced a little bit of anti-Semitism, um, uh, but to the to the Navy's credit. Um, they, uh, the teams that I worked with and the people that I worked for and with were very good at um, acknowledging it and um, working through it in, in a very, and quite frankly, I mean, this is, we're talking about the early 90s, a very just culture approach, um, really trying to get some understanding um, and, uh, you know, with the individuals that, that I had uh, met with or encountered and had some challenges with um, and really work through that um, to, um, provide them insight and, you know, support me um, and others uh, that went through similar, similar issues. Um, I do think the military um, has, you know, in many cases been on the forefront uh, of thinking through systemic racism. Um, uh, we've seen so many um, uh, advances in, in just the fact that um, it's quite, it's, it's there, it's being called out much more openly as we see in the medical world. And, and I think um, certainly as academic medical centers, as part of Harvard Medical School, uh, really proud of um, the work uh, that has started is, is very far from uh, being done, but you know, starting the conversation, getting it out there and really uh, making people aware. Um, and especially when you see leaders like uh, General Mark Milley, who's the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, last June, it, you, you may remember when um, uh, there was a sort of questioning by a congressional panel around um, critical race theory and uh, some papers like or uh, books like How to Be an Anti-Racist as part of some, um, uh, you know, leadership reading lists uh, for military members. And I think actually the reference might have been at West Point. Um, and uh, General Milley and Secretary Austin, who was a defense secretary, uh, stood up and said, you know, it's critically, they were being challenged on why this is being included. And uh, they said it's critically important uh, for our leaders to be open-minded and have shared understanding uh, of all aspects uh, of these current issues. Uh, and you know that's the type of leadership that that we do need when we're you know navigating these challenges. So I think, as uh, Salawa has referenced, uh, you know I think the military in many cases has been on the forefront. There's obviously been many tragedies in the past, but. There is a fair amount, again, that we can translate from the military experience to medicine to help advance this work. And um, do you, um, given the current climate, you know, in our country regarding everything from race, ethnicity, all the politics that are happening, how does the military foster community with respect to recognizing the individual uh, and where they are in, in, in society? I can take a first step. I think, um, you know, recognizing the individual with regard to community, the, the military community feels pretty tight uh, to me. I think, uh, you know, we met two weeks ago, uh, Salah and I, we had a phone call and, you know, uh, boom, we're immediately speaking the same language uh, and uh, talking about our experiences and uh, shared interests. And it, it, it's really a quick way to engage someone because you have that, that base. Um, that, that, that shared experience. Um, and that's what we see in our students, uh, you know, at HMS that are veterans or those that are uh, health profession scholars. Uh, it's really wonderful to welcome them into the community, to connect them with, um, you know, faculty members who either, again, are veterans or have an interest in this space. Uh, and it's incredibly helpful because one of the real challenges here in that community is tra transitioning to civilian life. Uh, you are going back to, a, or, back to a place, uh, maybe your first time as an adult in the civilian world, and it is a different language. There are different acronyms. There are different expectations. Um, and so much of what we do is, you know, 
comparing uh, the military experience, the civilian experience, and helping each other navigate uh, that work together. So uh, it feels like we do have a strong community. Um, no, to build on what Eric said, um, it's funny, we, uh, in some ways, the military can be a small community because we found out we have mutual people that we, um, that we know, even here already. Um, and, and I think actually that's very important and goes to um, the point about building community, because that's one of the things that the military does, is that it, it builds community. Um, and the question is, how do you maintain your identity within that community? Um, and in some ways it's easy, but even when it gets hard, um, as Eric mentioned, you know, you would expect your community to stand up for you, you would expect them to show up. And it would have, he would, I would say that you would have a very different view of the military if that happened and no one had said anything, no one had done anything, um, you know, and so when you, I, I think that what, um, when I think about where we are today, uh, when we consider personal identity, which is very important, I think what we've lost is the community, is that we don't have that shared sense of, quite frankly, what is the United States anymore. Um, I, I think that if, if you were to ask that question, um, it would totally depend on part where you are, you know, where you're from in, in the country. And that did not used to be the case, you know, um, 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so there, there is a balance between community and personal identity. Um, and I think you have to have, you have to have both. And so it, I don't think that an optimal, um, an optimal scenario is where we recognize personal identity in every form, but have no community. Most people don't want that. Um, and so th I think this is this, uh, there's always this tension um, and this balance between, you know, the individual and, um, and the community. And every few years, we, we sort of reassess what do we mean by community? Um, what do we mean to be part of that? And so um, I, a, few, um, a few months ago now, I uh, heard Dr. Um, Woodson give a talk um, on uh, leadership. And I think there were three other people who gave talks and they essentially said the same thing, um, which is you want to know your organization's core values. You know, in the Navy, it's very clear, honor, courage, commitment, <laughs> you know, but any organization, you want to know your core values because these are the things that you all agree on that, okay, this is what we stand for. Um, I would say that what I see playing out right now is we're redefining again, what are our core values? Um, and we haven't, um, we haven't come to an agreement on that. But once we do, that's when we'll find that rebalance between personal identity and community. That makes sense. So I want to take a pivot um, to talk a little bit more about the health system that, um, that our servicemen and women uh, experience when they're um, serving our country. And so one of the things that I think we notice here in, you know, uh, especially in Boston, there's so many hospitals, so many community health centers, PCPs offices, and it's a very disjointed system. The military is not like that. Uh, just can you give us a little bit of background, Eric, of sort of the overall structure of the military health system? And then we can start to think down into what does that mean for research? What does that mean for transitions of care? What does that mean for longitudinal care? And a couple other spaces that I think are really important for us to think about in medicine. Yeah, it's great. So I'll, I'll take a stab and then uh, Salewa, please uh, augment uh, as a person that was a clinician um, in the military. So, you know, in, in the military has gone through a transition um, in, in the last five years or so um, uh, in military medicine. Um, traditionally, uh, each of the armed forces, uh, and we're talking about Navy, uh, Army, and Air Force, uh, each really worked in a silo uh, traditionally. Um, there was some cross collaboration, but really I'd say about 20, 25 years ago, uh, there was a newer emphasis on a joint uh, type work and uh, joint commands and joint operations and, and other work. Um, this uh, you know, prompted some cross pollinization between the services and military medicine. 
Uh, and then within the last five years, the Military Health Service was created, um, which essentially joins uh, all three of those services and their, mil and their medical components uh, to have an overarching uh, leader, a four-star uh, service member, um, and uh, their reporting structure. Um, so there's more cross-pollinization. And of course, the last you know, 20 years of war uh, you know, prompted some of this uh, motivation to do more joint work together um, and focus on sort of scaling and uh, building on collaboration. Uh, there are military treatment facilities, uh, which are hospitals uh, that are dedicated military members uh, throughout the United States and the world. Um, there, and so not only there are military members that receive care there, uh, but their dependents. So uh, uh, family members like Alden probably received care at some point uh, at, uh, at a military treatment facility as a dependent. Um, and retirees uh, is another group that could uh, potentially uh, receive care. And obviously there's some overlap with the Veterans Health Administration. Um, with, uh, within care, there's direct care and indirect care. So direct care would be care provided for someone by uh, military uh, medical personnel, whereas indirect care uh, is essentially if I was a military member and I got care at BI uh, or MGH or Brigham, uh, the military has uh, an, an insurance. TRICARE is the construct of insurance that can be used at uh, non-direct care facilities for military members. And so there's you know, focus on, uh, on value, getting the uh, right patient at the right time to the right clinical care. Uh, there's a very much a focus on um, expeditionary care or battlefield care um, is one element, but you know the much broader piece is actually uh, care for uh, non-battlefield care. Um, and uh, when we talk about sort of funding resources um, uh, allocated to the Department of Defense for research and, and investigation, um, the uh, congressionally uh, directed mandated research program, CDMRP, is, is second to only the NIH in funding that uh, for uh, research, and much of it is not focused on battlefield care. It's things like breast cancer um, and uh, you know routine care uh, type elements. So there's a lot that we learn from military medicine and innovation that's translated to the civilian world. So I think I've tried to outline sort of the constructs of direct and indirect care, the military health service, um, and uh, some of the research buckets. Awesome. Um, Shalewa, what can, can you dive a little bit more into the research part of things? Because one of the things I think we struggle with uh, in, in academic medicine um, is research. I mean, we're here to produce knowledge, uh, but it seems as if the military is often giving us a lot of information uh, that we can use to, to care for our patients in, in academic health centers. No, definitely. I would say that, um, especially in the field of trauma and emergency care, um, the military, there's a lot of research that goes on in that. Um, a lot of people say trauma medicine is advanced by war, and that's true. Every time you have a major war, we come up with, um, we, we basically on, on the job uh, modify our systems and come up with uh, care, uh, optimal care. And I think we've seen that in how we manage head injury. I think we've seen that with the massive transfusion protocols that have come out of the, uh, the uh, Iraq war. Um, and so that's definitely, um, to use one of the acronyms, you're gonna hear a lot of JTF, Joint Task Force. There, there are a lot of Joint Task Force research projects looking at specifically that. Um, the other thing that is an opportunity for um, a lot of uh, the members who are um, watching this is, as um, Eric mentioned, the CDMRP, um, they're a funding source and you do not have to be active duty to apply for that. Um, you know, these are research, uh, these are research dollars. And so they all, they have their um, calls, you know, um, open access, calls for proposals. Um, and so in this, many of us, I think are on like the NIH, um, you know, um, email list serve, you know, for the different, uh, whatever uh, our research interests are. Um, I think that people should take this opportunity to um, use that also with the CDMRP. Um, there are databases that, um, are also very helpful for those who do um, health services research. Uh, you know, the ACTOR database, and that's the Automated Central Tumor Registry. Think of that as the CR database for the military. So um, every cancer diagnosed uh, within the military health system, um, we, 
there's a lot of data, you know, how, how it's treated, the outcomes, all of that is tracked. Um, and you can certainly request um, access to that database. Um, and then TRICARE is another, um, you know, we also maintain TRICARE database um, for dependents and those who get care on the outside. Um, it's a way for us to also see, you know, um, how they're taken care of. Uh, when we talk about cost effectiveness and things like that, we look, we use those databases to compare um, what they're getting on the outside with what's happening when they get care at a military treatment facility. Um, and then, you know, the VA sort of slightly different, but, um, you know, there's also a lot of databases there through the VA and um, a lot of the vascular studies, for instance, done by a lot of civilian institutions, um, you know, are through the VA. So, uh, two parts to this next question, and it sort of struck me with an experience I had when I got to visit the San Antonio um, Medical Health Center um, uh, for the military a few years back. And one of the things that I noticed was uh, the commitment to um, servicemen and women who are injured um, and uh, the longitudinal care that's provided to them. Um, and I think that's something that we in medicine think about, um, but not necessarily to the degree, right? We, we and, and so, can you just sort of, Eric, walk us through, for lack of a better term, uh, the ownership of the patient, keeping set patients within a longitudinal system for care, and what we can do in academic medicine to think about caring for the patient, not just in the immediate injury, the immediate need for care, but sort of that longitudinal care uh, to, uh, to keep a, a standard, a uh, higher quality of life for our patients. Yeah, let me actually, I'm going to ask Salewa to take a her perspective on that um, as a physician that served in the military, and then I can uh, chime in. How's that sound? Sounds great. So I think um, to allude to one of the things you had said earlier, when we think about the military um, health system, definitely one of the benefits of the military health system has been the electronic medical record. Um, the fact that it doesn't matter what military um, care facility you are, whether it's in Launchstool, Germany, um, Camp Pendleton, any physician um, can go into that system and can look up your notes. You know, you can look up the notes. There is no, you know, signing this form to get access or electronic medical release forms and all these things. Um, and so the, the data that you need, the information is right there. Um, and, and that's very helpful because we can all um, talk about um, episodes we've had with patients where we needed their medical records and we did not have it. And we're waiting and we're faxing to this outside entity to send us their reports and, you know, make a note in the chart that we're waiting on the outside medical, you know, hospital. Um, and then the other, um, the other part of that is having um, all the ancillary care that you need also within that system. So that means that, you know, when someone is when someone is injured, the trauma team takes care of them over there, they can directly call the, you know, medical providers um, stateside, they get stateside um, San Antonio, as you said, BAMC, these are great, you know, centers, they get everything taken care of. There's already a, you know, um, a physical therapy, uh, physical therapy that's already incorporated occupational therapy. All of this is, you know, streamlined and also within that context of care so that when patients leave that system, um, it's because the care that they need, they cannot, you know, we cannot provide within the military health system. That is when you, um, that's when they exit that system. But even then, those lines of communication and the medical records still need to be readily available. Um, so I think that when you, um, and Eric mentioned this, it was a huge change to move from, you know, Army health system, Navy health system, Air Force health system to a military health system so that it doesn't matter as long as you're within that umbrella, um, your medical information is readily accessible and you can get whatever care you need. Um, for instance, sometimes if, you, if physical therapy is going to be closer, better closer to home where your family is in Texas, we can find you a facility in Texas. Um, that knows exactly the plan you were on, what you need. And so that's no different in my mind than MGB now. You know, we're now this big organization. We have multiple campuses. We have multiple satellite locations. Our goal should be making such smooth transitions so that if you're seen at the ER at Brigham and Women's 
and then you're now seen in a follow up clinic at Mass General, those records should be readily available. The provider should be able to talk to each other, um, you know, collegially without, you know, any impediment. Um, and, you know, the next phase um, should be well established. You know, the lines of care and service in such a big organization is what we should be shooting for. Thank you, Eric. Did you have anything you wanted to add on? No, I think that's great. Uh, when you make the MGB uh, analogy, I think about that almost every day. Uh, if the Army, Navy, and Air Force could do it, then why can't we, um, right? And in even broader, right, just between MGB, uh, look, Alden's 100 yards away from me, right, yeah. in, in his emergency department, and we have challenges communicating there. So, you know, we all share the same mission. That's to take care of our patients. And, and clearly, we're competitors in some ways, but... Um, I think uh, we can learn a lot about finding and sharing that mission and executing on that mission together. So thanks. Awesome. Uh, you know, I really want to dive into this discussion around mental health. Um, I think that's something that we um, are struggling with. I, I, and I think we could talk about it from a number of different angles. I know we were originally going to talk about it to, you know, uh, for the military, um, specifically um, for, you know, what we do for the, as doctors or uh, therapists serving uh, patients or the service members, but we can also talk about it from, uh, you know, a situation of uh, healthcare workers and burnout. And I think that's another angle that we can, we can talk about this. Um, but I'll start with you, Salila, and then we can, uh, we can branch into the discussion around burnout um, and talk about um, caring for ourselves. Um, but we, we often hear about um, what the military does, uh, especially uh, with issues related to uh, homelessness after the fact, after individuals leave the military. What is, what is the military doing to address issues around mental health? Uh, what it, can academic medical centers learn from the military experiences? And then how can we ensure that those patients uh, that we are caring for um, have access to care, especially for those mental health conditions? You know, this is a, a very important topic and, um, and sometimes it seems so overwhelming. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that the military has done over the last decade to address um, mental, mental health has been to normalize, you know, to normalize mental health issues, um, specifically PTSD. And um, I, I think uh, Eric will probably um, also have um, some experience with this is that screening for mental health became routine over the course of the last decade. Um, it went from something that was not typically discussed to something that now we routinely screen for, um, we try and identify, um, and they um, and you actually have, um, you know, programs to t talk about it, talk about, you know, how to recognize, you know, whether it's burnout, PTSD, um, and, uh, you know, and ways of, ways of getting into treatment, um, so re resources that you have available. Um, I saw a question, um, you know, in the chat regarding um, homeless, uh, homelessness and uh, male bedrooms. And one of the things I think that uh, the military recognized um, a few years ago was that they did not do a great job in transitioning uh, from the civilian world, I mean, from the military world to the civilian world. Um, for someone like me, that transition um, is made easier by the fact that my skills are readily transferable. So what I did in the military is what I do now, essentially, I'm still in healthcare. But there are um, a lot of the population that you're talking about, I, I think a commonality is that there is no, um, some of the skills are not easily transferable. Um, and then when you um, come out into the civilian world, you seem to be unmoored. Um, and then you add the pressures of, you know, the economic pressures, um, mental, you know, whatever mental health issues, and this can spiral out of control and, you know, you, you end up with um, homeless, uh, homelessness. And so there are definitely programs now that are trying to address that. Uh, the VA has been a lot more, um, I think, a lot more active um, in understanding that, you know, that is part of their population. Uh, homeless veterans um, can get their care at uh, VA facilities. And when you're getting, and care is not just anymore um, their physical health, 
It's also their mental health. It's also how do we get them um, back into, you know, back into the community. So um, I, I think that the, the big steps that the military has made in trying to address this question has been to um, talk openly about mental health. You know, it's not something that you have to hide anymore. Um, screen for it, uh, make it just a routine part of screening, um, and then have resources, you know, uh, whether it's PTSD, um, depression, anxiety, um, so many people, you know, now you see some of the um, support uh, support animals that people have, uh, they, they really have tried to um, make this something that uh, it is easily tackled and not something to be hidden anymore. And that's not uh, that was not the case 30 years ago. And Eric, just to try and uh, touch on in the few minutes that we have remaining, um, you know, we in uh, healthcare are uh, suffering from year two going in uh, of this pandemic and caring for patients. There's been a lot of people to, to leave healthcare because of everything that's going on. Part of that's burnout. Uh, part of that is um, just uh, the mental distress that's coming from, um, you know, the tough situation we've been in with healthcare. Um, any thoughts on what the military does to support um, uh, healthcare providers overall, what they do to support uh, uh, the service members um, when they're in tough situations so that they can um, operate at the top of uh, their abilities and, and perform well on the job? Yeah, I, I think in general, we're nowhere we, where we need to be uh, for both civilian medicine and the military with regard to supporting mental health. Um, uh, as Salewa you know, mentioned, calling out um, and being open and honest about it is critically important. Uh, one of our, um, actually he's from Massachusetts, uh, General John Casey, who was the chief of staff for the army in sort of 2005 through 10 or something. He really invested in calling it out uh, around mental health and resources, investing in those efforts, which was wonderful. Um, but you know where we are now, uh, as you've alluded, is um, this is really um, this is the other pandemic uh, that all of us are facing, and quite frankly, it existed before COVID, right? Um, and there's been you know several efforts, uh, obviously from different centers, a center at Stanford and Mayo to try to you know, target interventions to help healthcare workers uh, navigate burnout uh, and uh, the challenges that we're facing. Um, and, you know, I think we're all learning uh, together. I will say the, the calling it out um, is uh, one of the critical first pieces and uh, providing an environment that's supportive. Again, this idea of a just culture environment, in many cases, it's the system, it's not the individual. So how do we support each other? And that's where you know we go back to the beginning of this conversation. It's the mission, it's the patients, it's the team, and uh, you know it all starts with something each of us can do, right? If you're see someone uh, and have an open and honest conversation, instead of someone saying "How you doing, Alden?" Tell me how you're really feeling. Don't just say "Okay" and keep moving. Let's actually talk about it because guess what? We're probably going through much of the same stuff. And together we can be stronger. Uh, it's not a structured method. It's not a evidence-based method, but at least that's something we can all do as a community. And I found that in the military, we were pretty good at doing that. You know, when you get a moment with your with your friend and your colleague and your teammate, just have that conversation and uh, and and help each other. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, and Eric, just uh, in in closing, can you just talk about some of the opportunities? Is who may be listening from um, HMS and one of our affiliates on opportunities for engagement in um, uh, in the work that you're doing. Sure, that's great. Thanks. So for the Harvard Medical School Civilian Military Collaborative, uh, you can Google us um, and sign up and join us. Uh, you don't have to be at uh, HMS. Uh, we've got many uh, individuals that participate in events virtually or in person. Um, uh, that community is really a community of students. Um, and faculty uh, who are uh, veterans or they're pursuing a career in military medicine or have had a career in military medicine uh, or just have an interest in, in uh, the civilian military space. And it's matching mentors and mentees uh, for both you know, social reasons or research projects, uh, social outings uh, once we get you know, through this next wave of COVID to kick that back off again, uh, and really a community uh, as we've discussed. Uh, the second effort locally um, is uh, Stepping Strong. That's a um, 
center based at Brigham, um, which is uh, focused on trauma innovation. Um, that was born from the Boston Marathon bombing um, and um, uh, has really focused on uh, as innovator grants on an annual basis that are $100,000. Anybody can apply uh, for research focused on civilian military translation. So as Halewa referenced, you know, tactical combat casualty care, right, caring for patients in the field, uh, pre-hospital care or tra traumatic care within a hospital or other settings or rehabilitation. Uh, so those are two sort of local uh, local efforts. And um, again, if people are interested in any of this stuff or need help to be connected, please reach out. I'm happy to make those connections for you. Awesome. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you to both of our panelists uh, for joining us. This has been a great conversation that we've had. Um, Eric, I see there was a request or two for you to provide uh, the links for the Civilian Military Collaborative. Um, I think I found the right link, so I'll try and drop it in the uh, chat. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, but uh, you can reach out to Eric directly if you're interested in finding more about the work that he's doing and the, and the collaborative efforts uh, that he's trying to build and keeping that sense of community um, here uh, at HMS and the affiliates. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Jasmine for all the hard work that she's done putting together this presentation. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Zoseni and Dr. Goralnik for being here in this space, sharing your experiences, talking so openly. Just want to highlight there's a few events that are going to be happening in the near future related to uh, the DICP. We have some uh, events coming together as part of our Better Together community. Uh, we have another equity and social justice conversation uh, in February talking about incarceration and uh, the health equity issues associated with that. Uh, we also have a film screening that's going to be happening uh, that, that same week. Um, be sure to click through this very quick ESJ poll that we have. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to us at the DICP on the website uh, provided. This session has been recorded and we will post this on our website within the next week. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank you to our panelists for being here for the, for the hour. Have a good day.